You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone and welcome once again to a Bible Answer. My name is Mike McDaniel and I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri. We're glad that you're watching a Bible Answer today. We hope you will tell other people about this program. Now we have three gospel preachers from our area to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. My name is Skip Andrews and I work with the Evergreen Street Church in Dresden, Tennessee. I'm Mike Peters with the Pottsville Church of Christ in Hickory, Kentucky. My name is David Gulledge and I work with the Whitlock Church of Christ in Paris, Tennessee. We're grateful to these brethren that they can take time out of their busy schedules to be with us today. And we're grateful also to you for sending us some good questions. Now our first question goes to Brother Skip Andrews. Brother Andrews, does intent play a role in marriage? If it does, are the parties free to marry after they divorce? For example, what if someone is trying to get into this country and the only way to get into it is by marrying a U.S. citizen? The couple marries just to get this person into the country and make them a citizen, but then turns around and divorces. They did not love each other. They just wanted to get the person's citizenship in the U.S. Would you deal with that, Brother Andrews? Okay, I want to introduce this answer with uh, a comment about the fact that if for nearly 50 years now I've been involved in listening to questions and thinking about how to answer various problems and questions as they come up. And I really would not like to have to say this, but it seems like a lot of times our questions and things that we deal with today have been used in such a way to create many issues and controversies and unnecessary divisions. That doesn't mean we shouldn't answer these questions and address them, but I do believe we ought to have a really different spirit than maybe we often have at times in questions such as this one. And having been an elder at one time for 12 years, I would suggest that we think about addressing specific issues within the eldership. That is, when we have these kind of things to deal with, and God meant for the elders to be the people that we go to and work our way through these kinds of questions. And then I want to make the point that when I hear a question like this, it's my obligation to assume that the person who asked the question has the right intent and really wants to know what the Bible teaches about a thing so that they can be aware of what God would have them to say or do or use in a situation if it were ever to arise that can be very hard to work our way through. So addressing the actual answer itself, um, we need to know what the Bible pattern is for marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And that actual positive pattern needs to be studied so that we do know all of the boundaries, the rights that we have in the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And of course, this subject begins at the very beginning of the Bible. In chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis, Jesus addressed it in his own lifetime in places such as Matthew 19. A large part of 1 Corinthians 7 addresses this. So we need to know those scriptures and what the Bible actually teaches in order to be able to answer these kinds of questions. And then we need to look for a way to answer it as simply as possible. In classes in arithmetic, when I was a child, one of the things that was at the end of many math questions was simplify. Reduce this to its lowest common denominator so it can be understood by anybody. The fraction one-half is easily understood, but it can be written in such a way that almost nobody would know that that's what it was. So to respond to this question, how do these people get out of this marriage that the questioner has asked? Well, there are only two ways to get out of it. One would be for one or both of them to die. 
and the other would be for them to divorce. But divorce in the scriptures has to have, in order for anyone to be justified in a divorce, there has to be a party in that divorce who has been guilty of fornication. So if these two were to divorce, according to the question as it's written, then they would be involving themselves in an, an unscriptural action to, to divorce for that kind of reason. So the intent, I don't know how much intent matters because there are in countries in the world where intent of the people getting married is never even asked. But the marriage, in this case that you're talking about, took place. They did intend to get married and they also intended to not stay married. And that looks to me like they're violating that pattern that says that they're not divorcing for any kind of biblical grounds. Now, if we're going to address these kinds of things in the body of Christ, let's make sure we address them with the intent of treating people fairly and working through these things so that we don't end up with more lost souls and hard feelings and more division. We can solve these matters in a way that shows the world we care about each other and the Bible and we're going to solve it in a way that pleases God. And thank you for asking. Thank you. And now to Brother Peters. Do Bible scholars within the church reject the KJV, uh, New King James Version renderings, uh, 1 John 5, 7, as a spurious addition to the scriptures? I have read this verse is not present in the oldest manuscripts from which the 1901 ASV, ESV, and others are translated. Brother Peters. Well, this is an interesting question. 1 John 5, 7 uh, says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Uh, when you look at the history of this debate, if you will, uh, most believe that this probably originated as a piece of allegorical exegesis uh, somewhere around possibly the 5th century. Most likely what has happened is a scribe who would take uh, the manuscript and have to copy it over. Sometimes they would make, they would write little margin comments and uh, they believe that this was somehow incorporated into the text sometime around that time, this comment that was made. Uh, this particular manuscript uh, was compiled for Erasmus. It's known as Manuscript 61. And it is this manuscript that he based his third edition of his Greek text, and that's the text that was used to translate the King James Version. And so we have this margin uh, comment added into the text now. Um, most, uh, most historians, most scholars believe that that's what has happened, although there is debate on both sides of this. This brings up a second question, though, and that question is, can we depend on the text that we have? And the answer is a resounding yes. There are thousands upon thousands of manuscripts of the New Testament available to us, more so than any writing from ancient literature. And we can depend on that. We have texts from different families of manuscripts that are in, in existence, and it makes, us, makes it possible for us to compare and contrast the two so that we can be sure uh, that what we have is as close to the original writings as possible. In fact, overwhelmingly, the majority of textual critics believe that we do have an accurate copy of the documents as they came from the pens of those inspired men. First Peter 1.25, the word of the Lord endureth forever. A second question that comes from this is that taking that verse out or leaving it in, does it change anything doctrinally? Now this is a comment on the three persons of the one Godhead. And the truth is, if you take it out, there is no change. Uh, when we look back Throughout the scriptures, we see all three, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, referenced over and over again. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. This is Jesus talking. So again, all three 
persons of the one Godhead represented. Ephesians 4 speaks to this. Ephesians 2.18, Acts 10.38, numerous other scriptures. So we can be sure that we do have an accurate uh, version of the Bible and we can be sure that the doctrine has not changed with or without this verse, no matter which way you fall on the controversy. Thank you for that question. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free track. Our track today is entitled, Hearing God in the 21st Century. If you'd like to have this tract, or if you'd like to receive in your home our free eight-lesson Bible Correspondence Course on the Church of the Bible, or if you'd like to send us your question, all you have to do is contact us, and you can do that in one of th uh, three or four ways. First of all, you can write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. Or if you like, you can email us. And that address is a Bible answer at earthlink.net. Or you can call our toll-free number. And if you do that, please, of course, give your full address if you're requesting materials. And that's 1-800-436-0463. Another way that you can contact us is by our website. We have a contact page there. Please go to www.abibleanswertv.org. Also, past programs of A Bible Answer are archived there uh, in, a, in a quick fashion for your viewing. Back to our questions. Now for Brother Gulledge's first question. When is it too late for an erring Christian to get right with the Lord? If it is not too late, what must one do? What if one is bedfast and in the last days? I have often heard, if there is life, there is hope. Brother Gulledge. Thank you so much for the question. <clears throat> to answer this question, I want to turn to the book of 1 John. And I think we can find our, our answer there. I want to do it by looking at uh, a few passages here. The first thing that I want to point out is, of course, the question is dealing with an erring Christian. And so we're already assuming that the individual has been baptized for the remission of their sins, added to the Lord's church, and has become a member and a Christian already. And so now they're uh, living in sin or they're unfaithful to the Lord. And so we already assume that because of the question. So what does an erring Christian need to do? Well, when we turn to 1 John, we, we see a number of things. The first thing that we see is in chapter 2 and verse 1 when Paul, or uh, John rather, said that these things I write unto you so that ye sin not. And it's not that he's saying that the listeners or the readers of 1 John won't sin, but rather they have instructions on how not to sin. And then he continues in that verse, And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous. Uh, and so we understand that we will sin, but there's a difference in living in sin and sinning. Uh, but this is where I want to pull the rest of my answer from. If we go to chapter 1, I want us to understand, first of all, that God will forgive any sin. In verses 7, uh, 8, and 9 of 1 John chapter 1, we read that if we confess our sins, verse 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want you to notice that word all. It says He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we conclude that there is no sin that God will not forgive. One of the blessings of being a Christian is when we do sin, we fall short of His glory. We uh, are able to go to God in prayer, confess our sins, repent of those sins, and He will forgive us. And so first of all, understand that if you are an erring Christian... Uh, we have forgiveness through confession, prayer, and repentance. Now, I want to go to 1 John chapter 5. And in verse 16, we read about there is a sin unto death. There is a sin that will not be forgiven. And we need to conclude already from verse 9 of chapter 1, God will forgive all sin. But chapter 5 and verse 16, there's a sin that He will not forgive. And so when we put the two verses together, we have to come to the conclusion that the only sin that He will not forgive, the sin that is leading unto death, is the sin 
any sin, all sin, every sin that is not repented of. And so my answer to this question, when is it too late for an erring Christian to, uh, to be right with the Lord, is I would agree that as long as there's life, there is hope. But don't put it off. Don't wait until you're bedridden. Don't wait until your final days because it then might be too late and you might not get it done and might not make it right with the Lord. And so as long as there's life, there is hope, but please make it right before it's too late. And I hope that this answers your question. Thank you, Brother Gulledge. To Brother Andrews, the person says so many congregations are getting so liberal today. Does one's salvation depend on the congregation? I know one should endeavor to find a faithful congregation. Brother Andrews. Again, we thank you for the question, and I hope that as we work through uh, at least a short answer, that this will be of some use to you. First of all, the question is vague enough that I can't put a context with it to tell you uh, what you mean by liberalism or how liberal or what the issues might or might not be. So we have to answer in a general way, just as if somebody were to say, they're so nitpicky over there, or they're legalistic over there, or they're issue-oriented and not give any details. So the fact is that these kinds of things can happen, and they can be, uh, once we understand the specific thing, violations of the Word of God. We can go one way or the other and violate the New Testament pattern for what a congregation ought to be. So those things are possible, and sadly, they are very common. They were very common in the New Testament. We see many things written to the letters of uh, the New Testament churches that exposed things that were wrong in those places and that actually they were told to correct them. The thing we could do if we're really going to work hard at this is to create an atmosphere where we actually can deal with the things that need to be dealt with so that we can correct them and work together in fellowship with one another. Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia. I don't know how many churches there were in Galatia when he wrote, but more than one. And he addresses them with regard to quite a number of problems. When he wrote to Corinth, 1 Corinthians, the list of things that was wrong at Corinth is at least as long as about any we could think of today. But 2 Corinthians indicates that they had worked on those and maybe corrected nearly all of them and no more than a few months had passed. 1 Thessalonians doesn't seem to indicate that there was very much wrong at all in that brand new congregation, but 2 Thessalonians, here they were with the need to do some things differently or else people would have to be dealt with with regard to the Bible subject of discipline. And then we have the seven churches of Asia in Revelation. One of those was Ephesus. When Paul wrote Ephesians, we don't have any indication of any major thing happening there that had to be corrected. But in Revelation 2, John said they had left their first love and needed to repent. So, yes, our, our salvation is connected to a congregation because New Testament Christians are part of a congregation. We just have to learn how to weigh the ma things that matter. We have to decide how we're going to address issues. We have to learn how to solve problems rather than just going somewhere else when we have them. And I think preachers are among the worst offenders at that, of not working things out, but just going. In 48 years of full-time preaching, I have never interviewed a congregation yet about what they believed before I went there. They interview me, and if they ask me to go, I go. And I've done it every time. I have accepted the first offer I got every time I got an offer since 1970. I don't regret making any of those decisions, even though there were some very hard things to deal with in every one of those places. But we have to learn to work things through and work things out. Our job is to help people not just to see an issue and then use it as a reason to say somebody's bad. We have, to, we have to use the Bible pattern for problem solving in such a way that we become better and stronger and more useful to the Lord in the place where we live and work. I hope you'll think about that and uh, 
let's learn more about the way to treat people in a good way rather than maybe just looking for an out. Thank you very much. Thank you. To Brother Peters, the Bible speaks of helping widows and orphans. The church collects food and money to send orphans homes to help them. Why is it that there are widows and widowers in congregations that are way below the poverty, li poverty level and they are not helped? I believe a Christian shouldn't have to beg for help. Acts 6, 1 through 6, James 1, 27, Galatians 6 and verse 10. Brother Peters. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. James 1, 27. We can turn over to Acts chapter 6. We see an example of the early church doing just that. There were some problems with some widows who were being overlooked and they had some needs and so men were put in charge of that to make sure they were taken care of. Why is it then that we find this particular situation today? And it could be for one of several reasons. It could simply be the person who needs help hasn't let it, been, hasn't let it be known that they need the help. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? We can't read each other's minds. And if I have a need, I need to make that need known. And that shouldn't be considered begging, but simply reaching out and asking for help. Sometimes individuals, well, we're prideful sometimes, and we don't necessarily want everyone to know about our financial troubles. But we shouldn't be scared to go to our spiritual family, the family of God, and ask for help. So it could be they simply haven't asked for the help. It could be that within the congregation, they're simply not very close. And we do find this in some congregations, and it's sad. As soon as amen is said, everybody rushes to the door and and, you know, we're not going to see each other until the next time that we have to come together, which may be even the next Sunday morning. And when we act like that, when we're not close to our Christian uh, brothers and sisters, we're not going to know about their needs. However, when we have the right attitude, when we love each other, desire each other's company, uh, we become very close-knit. And just like in our physical families, we know what's going on with our brothers and sisters. We know what's going on with our parents and aunts and uncles. We know about their struggles and their problems, and we can help uh, when given the opportunity. If we're close-knit like the spiritual family is supposed to be, well, we'll see that there's a problem somewhere, maybe even without them having to ask. And so that being the case, uh, we can step in and help. Uh, because we'll know about the problem, but we need to be close. It could be, in a third possibility, and I hope this isn't the case, it could be that a congregation has been taken advantage of. And when that happens, sometimes that can harden our hearts to where we just don't want to do benevolence at all. And we need to understand benevolence is commanded by God. And when people come to help, we're to help them. And if they take advantage of us in doing so, so be it. Our command is to help, and we need to continue to do that, even though there are some con men out there who would take advantage of that. Ultimately, we need to remember the judgment scene that Jesus pictures in Matthew 25. When he is separating the sheep from the goats, the sheep were those brethren who stepped out and, and were rewarded because they stepped out and helped their brethren with their needs. The goats, they were condemned. Why? Because they refused to help when help was needed. Thank you for that question. Thank you. We have a short amount of time, but we have this question for Brother Gulledge. Would the size of the ark have been adequate to accommodate a pair of every living species of animal? Brother Gulledge. Thank you so much for the question. This is a question I want to give you perhaps maybe three things to consider. And these are three things that I have recently considered because at Whitlock we just finished going through the book of Genesis. And of course, if you go to Genesis 6, you start reading about the flood and Noah and the ark. But let me give you three things to consider as we think about the size of the ark. Was it big enough to accommodate uh, every pair of living species of animals? First of all, we need to consider that there is a difference between kind and species. 
The question says, was there enough room for every species? Well, the Bible doesn't specifically say species. It says kind. Uh, for example, you have the dog family, you have the cat family, and so on and so forth. And so there were uh, two or perhaps even seven of every kind, uh, not necessarily species. A second thing to consider about the size of the ark and the animals is that we automatically assume that these were fully grown animals. Now, the text doesn't indicate whether they were or not, and I'm just kind of adding in there, but uh, there is the possibility that these, and size-wise, were not fully grown animals. They could have been baby animals, which would have allowed for more space. Now, that's just something to consider. But a third thing, whether they were fully grown, or whether they were not fully grown animals, or whether they were kinds or species, whatever, Number three, consider that God was involved. And however God made it work, it worked. Because with God, all things are possible. And so when I think about the size of the ark, how big was a cubit? Was it this big or that big? How big was the ark? I don't have all the answers. And I can't, all, and I can't even tell you how everything worked out with the room of the animals, Noah and his family, food for them for for however long they were on the ark. I can't give you all those answers, but God was involved, and I know that with God all things are possible. Thank you so much for the question. I hope these three points uh, were enough to help you understand the question. Years ago, I had the opportunity to study a, a fascinating book called The Genesis Flood. And that book is by John Whitcomb and Henry Morris. And they did this very thing. They investigated the number of animals that would have been on the ark, and they used the highest possible uh, estimates. And uh, they concluded that the biblical account uh, can fit known scientific facts regarding these matters. We believe the immense area to be equivalent to the area of over 50, uh, five. 120 standard railroad boxcars. That's an immense amount of storage for the animals, for the cargo required for the trip. And so we believe, as Brother Gulledge has said, that an all-wise, omnipotent, uh, omniscient creator uh, could figure out uh, that problem in a way that would be satisfactory for all concerned. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer Today. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.